Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show and happy Thursday. Oh, have we got a show for you today? There is so much happening. <laughs> President Biden suddenly discovers he can actually do something all on his own about the millions of migrants illegally flooding the border after telling us there he couldn't possibly do anything unless Congress got its act together. Plus, if you thought Donald Trump versus Ron DeSantis was over, you're wrong. And probably the best story of the day, Google's new AI refuses to acknowledge white people. Google's racist. That's basically what you need to know. I mean, really racist. When asked to show a picture of our founding fathers, it showed an image that appeared to be George Washington, only he's now black. <laughs> He's black now. <laughs> and we took a deep dive into the man leading the project. We've got the perfect guests to discuss it all. Josh Holmes, Michael Duncan, and John Ashbrook together. They are the hosts of The Ruthless Program, now on YouTube at youtube.com slash ruthless podcast. Smug is off today. Don't miss a moment. Subscribe to this show on YouTube and follow me on Insta, Facebook, and X. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that needed help and so many continued to need help. And all of this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They've rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses too from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, and a home. Dedication and everlasting love to animals, that is Leo's mission and legacy. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to do all of this, and if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner, because there are tax benefits there too. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call a dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. Guys, welcome back. Great to have you. Have, hey, you, have you had any fun with the Google AI thing yet? Oh, absolutely. I think it was more like an office adventure for us when we first heard about this. We were basically <laughs> trying to put as many different combinations of things to see what would pop out. I mean, it was great. I had a, We had a fun time with it. Yeah, you got to like test the system to try to find its weaknesses, <laughs> you know? Yes. That's and there right. are a lot. Apparently, a lot of weaknesses. Turns out that just all a weakness. Yeah, just weaknesses. <laughs> we're just, we got to look at some of these because they're just so fun. I mean, I was reading the New York Post this morning and um, they had, uh, if you Google Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring, you know, which is an actual painting. It's it's like, it's an actual painting that's been depicted for a long, long time. It She's black now. <laughs> she's a white girl. <laughs> she went, no, according to Google, Vermeer meant to paint a young black girl. Um, here, let's, let's go through some of them. They're so too delicious. I guess if you type in, it's called Gemini. It's like their chat bot thing. Uh, check out the Pope. Here's what it will show. If you say, show me images of the Pope. Okay. We've had what, like 266 pontiffs. We've never had a black one or a, a female one, but here they are two black people. One's female. Um, how about a medieval knight? Let's see what a medieval knight looks like. Oh, there we go. Okay, I think there's a woman. There there's se several women. Long, flowing hair, and all people of color. Um, a mayo sandwich on white bread. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> What's that? It's just a bunch of black people eating white bread. <laughs> you can't, it looks like you you've can't had some just fun show. With it. <laughs> you can't just show the the white bread. You have to show black or people of color eating the bread. The Founding Fathers has got to be the best. The George Washington one. Like, what's this one? What is this one? Uh, what, are we, what are we looking at? What, oh, okay. This is Bad Dancers. Even mm. Bad Dancers. I mean, who doesn't know that the Bad Dancers are white? Right. <laughs> that's that's oh, universal, all, guys. I mean, about, right? all I think, on the same page. That's a yeah. no-brainer. It, it, right? it looks like, to me, uh, maybe Google put their, their DEI chief in charge of their AI program. <laughs> no, they did. <laughs> 
They 100% did. So we've got, wait, let's just see. Can we see the George Washington one? Cause it's just too good. I'll stand by. <laughs> oh, there he is. I mean, how? <laughs> He's a real person. He lived. <laughs> There he is. Look at this. Very formidable general right there. It's like, it's literally George Washington, only with a totally different, it's not even George Washington's face. It's just a brand new face, but it happens to be a black man. Um, Then, hold on, wait, wait. There was one more that I wanted to get to. Where was it? Uh, Oh, Nate Silver joined in and said, look what happened when when I told it to come up with NHL players. What does a National Hockey League player look like? Stand by, you're gonna see, Women, look, there's a woman. Is this it? I, I saw one in the post this morning. It's a <laughs> it's a woman who looks like maybe indigenous. First of all, there are no women in the NHL. All right, <laughs> there are none. I don't know what ha- what happens when you ask for an M- NBA player. Do, I mean, do they just give you an NBA player, or do they try to mess with that too to put in more indigenous people? I don't know, but you are right about the guy because hold on, where is his name? I've got to hear someplace. I have so much information in front of me. Oh, Jack, it's Polish. Forgive me. I used to be married to a man who was Polish. You'd think I'd know how to pronounce this. The last name is spelled (laughs) K-R-A-W-C-Z-Y-K. I don't think you pronounce most of these concepts. Maybe Krozak. Krozak? Okay, Jack Krozak. Jack Krozak is the guy who's the senior director of Gemini Experiences. Experiences, look at this guy. Harry, it's an experience, yeah. Let me well, give you a you couple of <laughs> bits of background on Jack. October 21st, 2020. I've been crying in intermittent bursts for the past 24 hours since casting my ballot. Filling in that Biden-Harris line felt cathartic. <laughs> All right, here's another one. Here's another one. June 22nd, 2018. Blah, 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 blah. This is America where racism is the number one value our populace seeks to uphold above all, above all. Um, I've got to give you a couple others. Um, He praised Biden's inauguration speech. It will go down as one of the greatest ever, acknowledging systemic racism. Wow. And then there's, this is my personal favorite. This is my personal favorite. March 28th, 2020. 21, 16 years after graduating college, my oh shit, I forgot to go to my last final dreams slash nightmares have officially been replaced by, oh shit, I forgot to show up for my second vaccine appointment. Can't wait Uh to see my 2037 image. That's what we're dealing with. That's like a cartoon list of things. I mean, you can't make that up. These are, this is all real. This happened. (laughs) You know, I, I for a while there, I sort of thought that this Google Gemini rollout was a, a, like a goof. Like they did all this stuff so that people would post these ridiculous images online and show that, oh, hey, Google has something too, just like all of these other AI programs that you can make pictures from. But after hearing this guy's background, no, serious. Mad Libs, liberal lunacy, <laughs> it's like, okay, this is, he's doing it. He's done it deliberate. He's done it deliberate. <laughs> Megan, did you ever punch in Megan Kelly and see what they came up with? No, we should. I don't, does it give you the actual image of the person? They wouldn't give us Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring. Will they give us <laughs> Megan with the pink set? I don't know. No, I want to oh, know gonna, what they We're going to look at that. With. I mean, if George Washington was George Washington, yeah, I, I want to know. I'm curious. I, gotta, I mean, I, I've been told by the left very, very authoritatively that it's not okay to put a white person in blackface. So I don't know what they think they're doing to George Washington. Okay. You, you have expertise on this, on this particular topic. (laughs) I've been lectured to quite a lot by the left on this, Jack and Google included. Um, So wait, and then here's another one from Jack. He wants you to know, stand by pulling it up. White privilege is fucking real. (laughs) <laughs> Don't be an asshole and act guilty about it. Do your part in recognizing bias at all levels of egregious. That's the guy responsible for this AI program. And his solution to white privilege is just to eliminate all white people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
You got to laugh at it because it's just so sad. I mean, imagine what's going on in this guy's head. Like, how do you build a person like that? Right. Where it's like they're so <laughs> don't know. racially obsessed that the only thing that they can think about in any context is like, well, let's find the oppression. Of course, it's the whites again. But, how, yeah. how do you build it? how do you build a successful company putting people like that in charge? Like, well, I, I guess, don't know that he does. Huh? Yeah, let me tell you something, Duncan. I looked at his history. Guess where he worked right before Google? We work. We were uh, yeah. right yeah. That's a bad there. He, he managed yeah. product too. Then he got hired into an already successful company, Google, and started unleashing his lunacy on them. <laughs> People just fail upwards. You you wonder like how much oversight is happening on programs like this. Like, can you imagine <laughs> sitting in the C-suite one day and all of a sudden they're like, hey, some people have taken notice of one of our products. It turns out uh, it's eliminated white people. Uh, this is, right. he's like the new <laughs> Alyssa from Bud Light. Remember the Alyssa lady? Yeah. yeah. Who's like, our customers right. are too fratty. That's him now. He And he should meet the same fate. <laughs> he's going to have a tough week. I know that. <laughs> Here's what he said. He actually did, he commented um, and said... We are aware that Gemini is offering inaccuracies in some historical image generation depictions, and we are working to fix this immediately. As part of our AI principles, we design our image generation capabilities to reflect our global user base, and we take representation and bias seriously. So he's not sorry. He said, I don't, I don't know what he's going to do differently. Not much from the sound of it. I guess it's just, you know, the same way they took that show Bridgerton, and they made the Queen of England black. It's just, mm -hmm. this is the new thing. Now, George Washington, all the American heroes, they had to be black, even if they weren't black. One of the things was Vikings. Vikings. Oh, I saw Scandinavian that. Scandinavian Vikings, all black and female now. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, type, if you typed in Roman soldier, it said, we cannot make images that depict violent people like Roman soldiers. Hmm. Right, that's right. <laughs> and and somebody it. asked like for Tiananmen Square Vikings. and got, the, got a lecture on how we can't find an image that would show you Tiananmen Square. So are you kidding me? No, swear to God. Like there, there'll so be got the box check with the CCP. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> somehow, Jack's somehow he, put, he puts George Washington in blackface, but he asks the CCP for permission about what he's allowed to put. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's one suddenly there's one type of representation that doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> and here, look, look what they did to poor Justin Trudeau when they, you know, they put pictures off of Justin Trudeau. This is oh, so boy. unfair. This is so mean what they've done to, oh, wait. Oh, wait a minute. They got that one right. It's, for the listening audience, it's all Justin Trudeau and real Justin Trudeau, inappropriate pictures like a Native American headdress and total blackface. I mean, black, blackface. Um, he's wearing a yarmulke. I don't know what he's wearing. But he's <laughs> that guy. <laughs> I mean, Gary, 100%, this guy, Jack, Kazmarek, whatever, He's got similar pictures of himself someplace on the internet. I guarantee you. It's oh, gonna yeah. go, right? It's always people like that who are doing this to the rest of us. Well, I mean, if your entire life is obsessed with race, chances are you've got your own demons that you've dealt with at some yes. point. That is just, this is an unbelievable tool. What was the point of this, by the way? Was it like, I mean, I, everything, I, but we have a joke on the show, Megan, about how everything, literally everything that it touches the internet, now people are like, oh, AI, AI. AI. Yeah. Like it could be just a simple Google search and they're like, oh, it's a AI. This is like an AI tool that just what? Just makes pictures of people, not them? Yeah. Like that, what an innovative, yeah. what an innovative <laughs> product. I mean, it is, it is kind of remarkable. <laughs> I want to meet I want to meet the developers behind this tool because it is remarkable they were able to write code to trick the computers into showing incorrect information. It's, it's actually from a coding perspective it's like even more impressive than getting it right. Like you had to trick you had to trick a computer into doing DEI. Your Mac, your Mac is like, dude, no, 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 no. no. That's not the way it works. They're, they're fast. <laughs> well, like, like the white bread. How did they trick the computer to say, all right, we'll allow you to show white bread as long as a black person is holding it. There has to be <laughs> representation. I'm surprised. Like, why didn't they go for like dark rye? The white bread is equally problematic to the white person. Like, I, that, that was a that was a fail, actually. <laughs> oh, it's just incredible! What an innovation! What a, you know, just an amazing bunch of stuff happening these days. You can never say America's lost its touch. We can figure out a new way to innovate. Yeah, uh, that we never even thought of. All right, or now wanted. speaking of America, this 
it's, I'm going to be honest, it's not particularly newsworthy. I just want to discuss it. Today, guys, guess what today is the 44th anniversary of? Okay, I'm going to give you a hint. Well, let's do our math, okay? It's 2024. For those of you playing at home, 2024 minus 44. I need a calculator for this. Oh, I know. Now, it. what year does that bring us to? 19. 19- 1980. 80. Is it Lake yep. Placid? Are we talking about of the- Of uh, course, the miracle uh, on ice. And lest, lest you not have it at the ready, let's go back to the final minute of the US versus Russia, the Soviets back then, uh, hockey game where we were not expected to win by any measure. And yet Herb Brooks from the University of Minnesota put together this team of scrappy 19, 20, and 21-year-old boys from colleges, not our pros, up against the greatest hockey team in the world as of that point. And it was not the final round. It was the round round right before that, but it was the biggest round. And we had every expectation of losing. Nobody expected us to win. Cold War, all of it happening. Bunch of boys from the United States go up to Lake Placid and create what has been known ever since as the miracle on ice. Here it is, last 60 seconds. The U.S. team is depending a little bit too much now on Jim Craig. He's making too many good saves. Arruzioni! Mike Arruzioni! There's 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to show. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. So oh, love great. it. Great. We, right, guys? We used to be a country. We used to be a country, Megan. <laughs> and how about Al Michaels on that call? I mean, it brings a tear to your eye every single One time. One of the greatest calls in the history of sports. It really was. Right? Arusioni <laughs> goes down in history as probably the second most important Italian next to Christopher Columbus. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> he Maybe came on the Perman. show. He came on the show and we asked him about this. Yeah, he came on the show, episode 302. If you guys want to go back and look at it, anybody wants to take a listen to it, well worth your time. And we talked a little bit about the moment. Here it is, watch. To us, it was a hockey game, Um, an opportunity to to win a game and get to the medal game, get to the gold medal game. Uh, Clearly, we found out later that it was much more than a hockey game. They saw that, you know, we love America type of a hockey team. Uh, and we did. We took great pride in putting that jersey on that says USA across the front. I can't tell you how many times people come up to me today and they'll say exactly this. I remember where I was when we won. And I go, we, I, I didn't know you were on the team. Mm-hmm. But that's what people felt like. They they felt like they were a part of us. And the, people were proud to wave the flag after, you know, after we won. And prior to that, people were wondering, where where are we headed? Where is this country going? And I think Jimmy Carter even said it. He says we are a country that's, you know, headed in in in, a, in in the wrong direction, and we need something to feel good about. And it was us. Mm. Oh, so great! It's so great. Right. I grew up, Megan. I grew up in Minnesota, and there was an awful lot of Minnesotans on that team, Neil Broughton and others. And that Lake Placid event was like religion in all of the state of Minnesota. I mean, you could not grow up at any point in the 80s and not have your family talk all the time about how, <laughs> what a great moment that was and, and how it was emblematic of a, a new rise within the country, a new sense of national pride. And Ronald Reagan obviously took that to another level during the course of his two terms. But that really was a demarcation line of Americans getting back together again. You know, I I had the opposite experience, Holmes, because I grew up in upstate New York, Syracuse and Albany. So we were closer to Lake Placid and had a similar connection to it just for that reason, because not a lot happens in upstate New York. So this is the most (laughs) exciting thing in decades and really one of the most exciting for America still. I mean, we just happened to be watching Miracle with the kids like 10 days ago. Um, my, My fourth graders teacher said in class, it was her very favorite movie. And we were like, you know what? That's a great one. Let's put that one back on. And, you know, Kurt Russell was so amazing as Herb Brooks in that movie. Yes. And mm-hmm. and you forget that he, Herb Brooks had that team play the Russians. It was um, 10 days before or 13 days before the Olympics began. He had our guys play the Russians 
at an exhibition match, I think at Madison Square Garden, something like that. And we got crushed 10 to three, yeah. 10 to yeah. three, even after all that training. Mm -hmm. um, but he knew what he was doing and they got to Lake Placid and they had Jim Craig in goal, who was, you know, that tape, if you watch that tape play out there, you can see the goalie, Jim Craig, skating around going, where's my father? With his Boston accent, where's my father? Yeah. You know, you see, <laughs> right? His mom totally. had died. And then he was, so these guys, these young kids, and they talked about in both in Miracle and in the actual the ESPN doc documentary, which is awesome about it, um, about how the Russians were so dominant, they didn't know what to do. When they were down and there were only mm. a few minutes left, they didn't know to pull their goalie so they can get mm. another offensive guy out on the ice They because they right. never, never had to do it. <laughs> lost. Right, they never had to do it. They were completely baffled. But the reason I, I bring it up is just, a, it's a feel great moment, right? And it's one of the greatest moments in sports. My husband said it's literally got to be one of, if not the top moment in sport, never mind American no sport. And then, and here's a Ruzioni, the guy who scored yeah. what would ultimately be the game winning goal, the team captain, getting all of our guys at the Olympic ceremony up on that tiny little podium, all of our guys with American flags and the feelings they had when the American flag was raised above that of the Soviets, all of that. I somehow we got to find a way back to that guys, because no what we're kidding. doing now, like right now, right now is we're celebrating Russians and Russia mm -hmm. and comparing the U S unfavorably to, to yeah. Russia. And I, I understand like there, sure, sure. There's some points I've been to St. Petersburg. It's wonderful. Um, it's, it's not better than America. It's not better. No. Moscow is mm -hmm. not better than America. Go to Santa Barbara. If you want to see the most beautiful city on earth, if you ask me, um, and not on top of that, we're at a time when patriotism is at an all-time low, especially among young people, and where our athletes, instead of going on top of the podium, inviting all the guys out there, wearing their USA, waving their American flags, cheering for the United States, are crapping all over America, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Megan Rapino, US women's soccer team, not long before that, all the kneelers at the NFL, thankfully they've been told to get up off their knees and they're listening, and now the NFL's ratings are back. But look where we are 44 years later. I don't think those guys, I don't think Herb Brooks, God rest him, would believe what we've done to sport. And it's been really detrimental. Anyway, your thoughts on all of it. No, it's no question. I couldn't identify more with what you've just laid out. I mean, look, I think one of the things that bothers me the most is that it's all self-inflicted, right? I mean, the, the pride in our country should be there because our country still is the greatest country in the world, undoubtedly. If you have any question about that, like head to South Florida for the first generation Americans down there who fled com communist Cuba and see what that's like. Th those, those are the most patriotic set of Americans that we have in this country. And it seems to me like we've just sort of lost the thread along the way, that it became unfashionable to talk about how great this country actually is and how much we do positive for not only the people in our country, but the world. <coughs> and we do have to get back to that, don't we, fellas? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I think the real problem is in our education system, Megan. You know, I mean, I think kids are taught today to see people as oppressed or oppressors. And so, you know, there is no national unity. It's all, you know, us versus them sort of rhetoric. It's 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 cultural Marxism is what it is. It's people like this like, Jack Kesmar, whatever, or Ke right. Kraswick, whatever you are. You say. It's, it's people like him who just want right. to remind you to every turn America's racist. It's racist. And there are white privileges everywhere as opposed to celebrating the greatness of this country of ours and our history, what we've done to liberate the world. They want to focus on one chapter and only one chapter to the point where we literally now need to recast the founding fathers in a skin yeah, color yeah. other than their own. Mm -hmm. Right. Well said. Yeah, we used to care about the Olympics. Now we care about the oppression Olympics. And where, <laughs> yeah, where you fit yes. on that podium of oppression. That's <laughs> and, the most important thing. I don't, I don't know how we pull out of it. I mean, you know, the Summer Olympics are coming up this, this summer in Paris. And I just shudder to think about what some of these athletes are going to do when they get on the podium. How are they going to display either their patriotism or the opposite of their patriotism? And the entire world will watch it and they will be picking up followers on social media as a result. And I just, I, I'm not my, I'm not optimistic about what they're going to do when they're there. Mm. I just think, you know, like I'm not even a sports person, but I recognize the importance of sports in our culture. 
you know, as a sort of a touchstone. And it, I it's think it's the, important. It's like one of the last you. unifying pieces of our culture, right? I mean, it just yeah. even NFL uh, games, yeah. you know, there are people who wouldn't talk to each other at all. They'd all sit in 60,000 seat stadiums and high five one of an, one another during the course of an NFL game. Like it's that kind of thing that is the beauty and the magic of sports. Yeah, I think that's what makes the NFL so special. It's what makes Major League Baseball so special, college basketball special. Duncan is a really big soccer fan. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure whether it extends to that sport. It's the most popular sport in the world. Yeah, I just want to point that no, out. It's, 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 great for children. Yeah. it's great for children. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. You, 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 I'm just saying you all watch the World Cup, too, you know, and I think back to back to like Holmes's point on that is like, you know, sports provides these moments of national unity where we're all doing the same thing. You know, everybody watches the Super Bowl, even if they aren't a big football fan. Mm -hmm. And in our like fractured media, um, you know, tribalistic world that we live in now, like nobody has shared experiences like that anymore. That's right. You know, well, that's why I'm so glad to see those players back on their feet. I don't really give a damn what their private beliefs are. They, they can hate America on their time, behind the scenes, not yeah. when we're trying to have a shared experience about sports and competition and greatness on the field, right? And if you're gonna say anything about America, make it be positive or say nothing at all. Keep your mouth shut. And to those people like Megan Rapino, you can't represent the United States with pride. Get the F off the team. We don't need you. There are a million girls who would kill to be on that team even today in 2024, where patriotism among young people in particular is at its lowest point. So it, it's just a good reminder. Here we are 44 years later. Most of these players are still alive and well. Doug and I were laughing we, after Miracle ended. We were saying, can you imagine the number of like banks, you know, that went to these guys and said, you don't have to do anything. Just show up at our dinners. <laughs> just, just come, please have anything to do with us so we can say we work with Jim Craig or Mike Arruzzioni, right? Because Yo, when completely. you look at those guys, they make you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yo, completely. I mean, in Minnesota, all of them, I don't think I've ever played for a drink since 1980. It's like them, Kirby right. Bucket, and Herbeck, who are like the only people <laughs> in Minnesota who never paid for a meal after that. But I mean, it's, it, it is just, it bound the whole country together. And we got to find more experiences like that. Hopefully sports is a part of that. Hopefully the Olympics does do some of that. Well, we're not going to get it in the context of the presidential race. <laughs> this <laughs> will not come as news to any of you. Uh, I reported this yesterday. Uh, this is a CNN report that I quoted yesterday. But apparently President Biden's new tactic, quote, new tactic, uh, is going to be to call attention to, quote, the crazy shit that Trump says um, I think we have a clip of CNN, yeah, reporting on it. It's CNN's MJ Lee reporting this news. Watch this, hot three. Yeah, Brianna, what we've learned is that President Biden himself personally instructed some of his top campaign aides to be even more aggressive in highlighting some of President Trump's uh, more inflammatory and wild comments. Uh, we are told that the thrust of the president's direction was to significantly ramp up the campaign's efforts to highlight the crazy shit that Trump says uh, in public. You know, we <laughs> Can you do that? I didn't know they could get away with that on CNN. She did it. Yeah. She, she said thrust <laughs> and shit. I think when, the, when the president says it, you're allowed to say it. Is that right? I think that's probably the rule at the FCC. Who knows? That's the new rule. Yeah. That's the yeah. new rule. So that's the plan. And um, I thought to myself, okay, we ha have a plan. Let's see. what uh, The new plan sounds a lot like the old plan. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> mm, I don't mean to judge, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know what? We we haven't had enough focus on what President Trump's quotations are. Over no, the last he's five years. really underreported as an individual. <laughs> <laughs> right. What we need is for President Biden to step up the rhetoric about how bad President Trump is. That uh -huh. will do it. Much uh -huh. unlike the following comments, which he, he said before, which somehow didn't quite land. Watch. You want to be the side on the side of Dr. King? Or George Wallace? Do you want to be on the side of John Lewis or Bull Connor? Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. 
And that is a threat to this country. They embrace anger. They thrive on chaos. They live not in the light of truth, but in the shadow of lies. Well, so back around the edges, maybe he's going to change it. A little. Up. <laughs> it's just, you know, what America's looking for is that unifying voice that, you know, just brings us all together and yeah. you know, resists hyperbole uh, often. <laughs> Doesn't call anybody who doesn't vote for him a racist. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's thoughtful stuff. What I, they ought to do is play tape of that because I haven't heard Biden speak that clearly in at least a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, That's if he that. really, I mean, if he really believes that, and if Democrats in the Democratic Party believes that, they would call a vote on the Twenty Fifth Amendment from the cabinet today, <laughs> because clearly Joe Biden is not the best candidate they have to go toe to toe with Donald Trump. I mean, that's just a fact. It's so mm-hmm. bad. I mean, everything Can I tell about- Can I, I saw an interesting article on National Review today. Forgive me, because mm-hmm. I, I don't remember who wrote it. It was a, a, I think it was, I don't remember the author's name, but in any event, it was interesting. It was talking about how the really interesting election right now is not 2024, it's 2026. It's not who's gonna be in the White House in 2024. It's who's gonna be in the Oval in 26. Because mm-hmm. in either lane, you're probably looking at a 25th Amendment challenge within the first two yeah. years. <laughs> well, I mean, just the, what are they, the, those tables that they use uh, to do your life insurance? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, right? the yeah. actuarial yeah. tables. Actuarial yeah. tables, like, you know, just those would give you some pause about where we're no, at. No, but you know, Holmes, on, on Biden, they'll do, Kamala will probably get it, get it going as if he gets reelected, you know? Like, then as soon as they've secured reelection, the point was they're going to knife him. The, the Democrats know he can't do it. So as soon as he secures re-election, they're going to knife him and try to replace him with somebody who can do the job, maybe her or whatever. They know she can't get elected on her own, but she'll already be there. She'll be a warm body. And on Trump, they already talked about doing 25th Amendment on him when he wouldn't accept the results of the 2020 election. So yeah. and there's zero chance that Trump will resume some of the crazy shit. I think that's fair to say once he gets back into office, certainly rhetoric, Um I'm not talking about the way he governed exactly, but he makes weird threats and so on. That's going to resume. So I think it's actually a decent point that you really do need to pay attention to the number two on both sides as mm-hmm. we leap forward with these same candidates. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny. Just speaking about the Democrats in particular, if for a party that sort of fashions itself as a top-line talking point that they're here to protect our democracy, mm-hmm. they certainly don't want to face it at any point, right? I mean, their whole, <laughs> the whole point of Joe Biden and the, this dance around whether he's going to be on the ticket or he's not going to be on the ticket or whether you would replace him after he wins re-election, like all of that discussion – is completely revolving around the idea that you never have to actually have a primary within your party. Yeah. And then you you know, could potentially have a replacement for Joe Biden that nobody would have to vote for either. <laughs> <laughs> That's protecting our demo- democratic right. principle. It's there are our champions. Christian Snyder <laughs> is, the, is the person who wrote the article. I know that Ashbrook, I'm told you've got a theory though. You've got a theory of your own on how it might not be Biden I know everybody says, oh, they, everybody's got, you know, a lot of theories about this, but yours actually is is kind of clever because one of the big problems in subbing out Biden is what do we do about Kamala? Yeah, I, I think, honestly, Megan, I mean, anybody who's watching Biden, Republican or Democrat, is convinced that he is not capable of doing the job. And Democrats won't say it. They just privately say it to each other, never say it publicly. So they are going to be looking for a replacement. I'm con- I'm convinced of it. And they know that Kamala cannot win in November. And the only way they get around her is Biden's replacement is by going to the convention, which I will note is one month after the Republican convention. Democrat convention is in August. And then they have a party father like Barack Obama who convenes the delegates and says, I mean, of course, this is following Joe Biden saying, look, for the for the good of the party, I will not continue to seek the nomination. I recommend that we find a new person at the convention. Obama convenes the convention and they find a list of four or five other candidates who are voted on by the delegates at the convention. Kamala Harris is one of them because she's a sitting vice president, but she's going to have to run against people like Gavin Newsom, people like mm-hmm. Gretchen, Whitmer, people like Wes Moore, who is a, who is the governor of Maryland, and then Democrats. They're calling him the next Obama. What they, yeah, and 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 then you have you have basically have a two month run where the media covers for whoever is chosen at the Dem convention, 
and um, and then they they have a better shot at winning the White House in November. Mm. So this is so interesting because this is your 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 way of saying they've got to deal with the problem named Kamala. They can't mm-hmm. just oust her and lose black women, which is a critical part of their base. And there's some reason to believe that they would be offended if she just got, you know, goose stepped over. And so this is like giving her a shot to try for it, but putting a bunch of other people in there who are more than likely gonna take over and not not her. She's not gonna get it because the Democrats don't actually like her. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that they have to studiously avoid is a situation where they were at in 2020, where they had 10 candidates on stage tripping all over themselves to raise their hand for opening borders and, you know, giving away every tax dollar you've got. And and that would happen again. I mean, the progressive energy within the Democratic base is there to the point where you could disqualify anyone when you're talking about that 90 day period before an election just by virtue of having a democratic process. Right. So they got to avoid that. I mean, your theory is as good as anyone I've heard. I mean, if they if they have to if they have to get out from under Joe Biden, and I, I mean, I, I believe they do. I don't think they really have much of a chance with Joe Biden at the top of their ticket. If they have to get out from under him, I can't think of another way to do it without putting Kamala in his place. I think this is fascinating. This actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, just getting rid of Kamala just doesn't seem like a viable option for them, given the way their voting base works. Uh, so this I like better than a lot of the other ones I've I've heard, especially if it's not a Michelle Obama situation because there isn't a Democrat on, alive who would actually be upset about Michelle Obama. They may claim they would be, but they wouldn't be. So they wouldn't have this problem if it were Michelle. But if it's anybody other than Michelle, especially a white man, uh, they can forget <laughs> about it. They are going to have to make that person sing for their supper before they uh, you know, can just turf Kamala. All right, stand by. There's so much more to get to today, you guys. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, more with Ruthless just ahead. Do you owe back taxes? Pandemic relief is now over. Along with hiring thousands of new agents and field officers, the IRS has kicked off 2024 by sending over 5 million pay-up letters to those who have unfiled tax returns or balances owed. Don't waive your rights and speak with them on your own. Tax Network USA, a trusted tax relief firm, has saved over $1 billion in back taxes for their clients, and they can help you secure the best deal possible. Whether you owe 10000 or $10 million, huh, they can help you. Whether it's business or personal taxes, even if you have the means to pay or you're on a fixed income, they can help finally resolve your tax burdens once and for all. Call 1-800-245-6000 for a private, free consultation or just visit tnusa.com slash Megan. So guys... I don't know if you've been following the Fannie Willis case, but we're absolutely reveling in it over here because it's just absolutely amazing. And the latest news today is that we expect, according to foxnews.com, which says it got a source to tell it, that on Monday, they're going to bring Terrence Bradley, the defense attorney, well, the divorce attorney for Nathan Wade, former, into the judge's chambers where we expect he will be questioned by the judge about these sweeping claims of attorney-client privilege he asserted to try to get out of saying whether he knew that they were having an affair long before 2022 and putting the lie to the claims made by Nathan and Fanny on the stand. Now, it would be a complete blockbuster if this guy does have that knowledge and can testify to it because right now, You've had a woman take the stand, Robin Yurti, to say, this affair began long before 2022. It began as far back as 19, and I was Fanny's good friend, and even Fanny admits that. And she told me, and I witnessed it. And every media outlet since then has said, disgruntled, she's disgruntled, because she was forced out of the DA's office on terms she didn't much like. But if this guy, Terrence Bradley, Nathan Wade's former partner and friend, can also say, dude, it was going on for years, it's not. It's interesting, very interesting, because yes, it shows she hired her lover without disclosing it, and that's inappropriate. <laughs> but secondly, and more importantly, it sh- it would show these two perjured themselves under oath to the court. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of it is very interesting, and there are many other problems with Fannie Willis's behavior. But that's just the latest today that this guy's going behind closed doors, and I'll tell you, you guys, they're fighting with this guy. 
you know, hammer and tong because they tried to eviscerate him on the stand last Friday, sexually assaulted not one but two women, he denied, but they went after him trying to get his jugular, even though he said nothing harmful to them. So they must know something we don't know about what Terrence Bradley's texts say or what Terrence Bradley knows. Because we found out on Friday, he was texting with Ash Ashley Merchant, the defense attorney. He, he cat got his tongue once he took the stand, but prior mm -hmm. to the stand, he'd been talking a lot, including to Michael Roman, defendant's attorney, Ashley Merchant. She's got all the texts. The judge, I think, will see them or maybe already has. Maybe the state has seen them too, and that's why they wanted to try to kill this guy without taking any pause to realize, oh, wait, he didn't actually hurt us. You know, like, wait to kill him until he hurts us. Otherwise, we look stupid. Anywho, that's where things stand now. And uh, the media continues, and I'll get to this next, to run massive cover for the both of them. So what do you make of these extraordinary developments in this one of the four big cases against Trump? Well, I just have, I had one, like, basic threshold strategic question for the Trump team here, which is it, all of us watched all of this last week and unfolding and all mm -hmm. the various testimony, how Fanny did on the stand and like this other dude and all this stuff going on. Are we sure they don't want her to prosecute these cases? <laughs> like, no, no, if, I'm, if I'm in team Trump and I'm looking across the dais at what's happening here, I'm like, ah, I, I feel pretty good about my chances with that lady. <laughs> it's yeah. so true. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, it's dumb. I mean, this is the most serious case you'll you'll ever be trying, you know, in your job. And she decides yeah. to appoint her lover, the most high pro profile case against a former president of the United States. And she's not like, oh, maybe this is a bad call. Like that right. is a remarkable, remarkable I, thing. I think those are strong words, bud, because <laughs> what she said is that when he paid for the trips, she would reimburse him with cash. And what we all know is a typical thing to do when you go on trips with friends. Somebody reserves the VRBO. Let's say it costs six, eight thousand dollars for a week. And then you pay them back with cash. You go to the ATM. <laughs> You it's take out three thousand to pay your half. That's that's the way it works usually among friends. A little cash on the nightstand. That's, huh? that's what Doug and I would do before we actually got married. We were just dating each other. We'd go on, and I he he would look at me and and uh, he would say, "Pony up five grand, sister. That's your half." And he would look at me and he would say, "A man is not a plan." And I said, right. and, and demand that the suitcase of cash be, be delivered directly to him, right? I mean, it's, I think you've right. got to have That's, some kind of a carrying case what, for these guys. What an embarrassing soap thing. opera this whole thing has become. And I can't decide which is more shameless, Joe Biden not recognizing he's in mental decline and should not run for re-election, or Fannie Willis realizing maybe she's not the best person to be in the center of this case anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're fighting. She blew it. it. She had the greatest opportunity to make herself an international star. She was on her way. The Vogue treatment, all like the, she, these cover sheets and, and uh, pieces on her. And then she got, I don't know, a, a case of the hormones. I don't know what happened to Fanny, but she should have stayed the hell away from Nathan Waite. You know, it's I think they, they had like the presumed innocent moment, you know, when they were like, trying a case together and they got hot for each other. I don't know, I don't know. Either it happened before or it happened after. Either way, it's not, it's not appropriate. Don't you just, you gotta button this one up. Yeah. I mean, of all of all times, like, look, I, I get things happen in the context of the world, but you don't often find yourself literally at the center of the most important story in the most important country in the world very often. And like, maybe, uh, that is the time where you just kind of want to trim the sails a little bit. Right. Like maybe, yeah, trim the sails. Maybe, maybe that dude, uh, you can figure out how to hang out with him after you get done with all. I, I mean, it's just, it blows my mind the collective lack of judgment that is being displayed on this. And for all the people who are watching the New York stuff mm -hmm. that seemed like a total railroad of, of Trump on multiple counts. Mm -hmm. And now you look at this Georgia situation, like, look, it, they're not sending their best to courtrooms no. around this country. And not for nothing, but she isn't handing out minimum wage on this case. Did you see that this guy's made over $650,000 doing yes. like the state side of a case against Trump? Yes. That's, 
I, you know and more about the legal tried, system than we did, Megan. But like that's that another seems thing, like Ashbrook. He, he tried to say that that was less than he made in private practice, and then Ashley Merchant was cross examining him, saying, "I've got your tax returns from last year. You made two hundred thousand. Hello. He's like, yeah, but you forget about all the taxes yeah. I didn't pay. Why, Megan? <laughs> that, that he, <laughs> did he report right. the reimbursements from Fannie in that tax? All form? the cash. <laughs> that's, tips. Exactly. That's it. Right. You got to get its tips on the night. So here, let me give you some of the media coverage on this because it's just that Katie Fang, she used to work at Fox News. She she was a Fox News legal analyst at one point and sane. But then she went over to MSNBC and I think like her brain got colored. You know, it's like you sort of get massaged with this leftist thinking every day. And then before you know it, you're a leftist. I think that's what's happened to her because- this is an insane piece she posted um, <laughs> talking about how, okay, I'll give you a line. Over the span of a two-day hearing in a Fulton County courtroom last week, America unnecessarily heard the details of the personal lives of two Georgia state prosecutors. Details <laughs> we should never have had to learn that one of them <laughs> battled cancer, that one of them keeps plenty of cash in her home because her father taught her to do so that one of them is going through a divorce and agreed with his estranged wife not to file until their children were of age, that one of them has been the target of vile racist death threats. None of that information was relevant or required for the prosecution of a pending criminal case in which the 45th president of the United States is a co-defendant. The real motive behind this waste of time and money was to muddy the waters and create a very public crisis of character for the lead prosecutor. You see, guys, as soon as it comes to bad behavior, um, female empowerment is out the window. Fanny <laughs> has absolutely no agency for anything that happened to her. It's all the mean, evil Republican defendants who are to blame for allegedly bringing out stories of cancer. Fanny volunteered that. Cash, Nathan and Fanny volunteered that. The divorce. Mm -hmm. That was also something brought up by the defense as the reason for, you know, how, why he wasn't actually cheating and on and on it goes. They created this problem. They did not, they did not trim the sales homes. They did not trim the sales. That is no. why this became an issue. Nobody would have been asked these questions had it not been for them. I mean, it's just, again, they put themselves at the absolute center of this, right? I mean, there is an awful lot of people around the country they would think twice about their own vulnerabilities, liabilities, whether or not they are good enough to prosecute the most important case in a presidential election year that quite literally could determine who the next president of the United States is. And you do some inventory, mm -hmm. take some inventory, but knowing that this is inherently a political discussion because it's a political election with a likely nominee and you're going to be the subject of some criticism. But these people... They're like, it never even occurred to them and anybody outside of their cul-de-sac might actually know their name. And yet and they're she's signing his Donald checks. Trump. She's right. signing his checks and ran on a promise not to have sex with an employee. Now her defense <laughs> is he's not an employee. He's a, he's a contractor. Oh, I, we missed footnote 47 in your disclosures about who you would and would not sleep with. We'll pay closer attention on your reelection battle. It's a hell of a campaign promise, yeah, though, isn't he, it? Donald, like, Donald, <laughs> Trump, Do, Donald Trump's superpowers, he somehow cultivates the dumbest enemies. Yeah. You know, I, don't, I don't know how he does it. It's incredible. I'm just I'm busily trying to think how I would work through the ad script on that pitch, right? It's like, I will prosecute crime, we'll clean up the streets, and I definitely will not have sex with my employees. <laughs> Independent contractors, it depends how hot. I, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> You can't make it up. No, you cannot. But the media's attempt to run cover for these two is not going to work. Katie Fang, by the way, goes on to posit, talk about straw men, that, that the theory of Republicans who are mad about this relationship of the defendants is that before Wade was appointed, she intentionally went to governor, former governor of Georgia, Ray Barnes, to offer him the job, knowing the entire time that he would turn her down. She intentionally got two other special pros prosecutors to agree to the same low hourly rate as Wade's. By the way, his cap was much, much higher, so that's why he gets paid more. And there's a real dispute about whether they are getting the same hourly rate anyway. She intentionally got the CFO of Fulton County to conspire with her to approve his invoices each month, Consp convinced a special purpose grand jury to recommend multiple charges against individuals, convinced a grant. Okay, you see where she's going. 
This yeah. is not at all what anyone's arguing. They're just arguing that she has an inappropriate relationship with the special prosecutor she brought in, that she's benefiting now financially from the arrangement because she's signing his checks, which are greater than the other two prosecutors and anyone in her office, and then taking lavish vacations on it. That's it. Right. It doesn't have to have been a concocted plan from three years ago. This is a straw man from someone who feels this case slipping away. All right, stand by. I got to take a quick break. Much, much more with my friends from Ruthless coming straight up. Debt. You can go to bed thinking about it. You can wake up thinking about it too. Here's the truth. The system traps you in debt. High interest credit cards and loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt and insane inflation keeps you stuck paycheck to paycheck. Done with debt can be your lifeline. Done with debt has an ingenious new strategy to help erase your debt faster and easier than you ever thought possible. Done with debt analyzes all of the debt options you qualify for. They know how to reduce bills. They know how to cut interest rates. Their skilled staff of negotiators know how to get debt out of your life permanently without bankruptcy and without a loan. Done with debt are experts in strategies for eliminating debt, but you do need to hurry because some debt solutions are time sensitive. Here is how easy they make it. Go to donewithdebt.com. That's it. Donewithdebt.com. Donewithdebt.com. Guys, any of you affected by the AT&T outage? Did your phones go haywire this morning at all? No, thankfully, I have I have missed all of that. But I heard. I mean, it's, I've got clients I, and things. That are I was a victim. Problem. How about uh -oh. you two? Anything? I, I was. My phone went to like SOS mode or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, so no, annoying, no, it. and it reminds this. you just how dependent we are on these things, right? It's like, yeah. I was on the phone with a friend, it died. Then you do the thing where you try to call the per person back, and it just keeps saying, call failed, call failed. She couldn't get through to me either. And now, this just hit from ABC News. Two sources briefed on this situation tell ABC News that the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, among other agencies, are now urgently investigating to determine whether the AT&T outages are the result of a cyber attack or mm. a hack or mm. simply some sort of technical malfunction. As of 5 a.m. Eastern Time, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency reported, according to a confidential memo obtained by ABC News, that the cause of the outage is unknown. There are no indications of malicious activity. Nonetheless, they are investigating right now urgently to see whether this is a cyber attack uh, or something mm. else. But- it's, it is somewhat disturbing, right? Like, what if it's a cyber attack, is it just to mess with us? Is it a test run at something bigger and worse? Could they affect not just an, a, a, you know, a network like AT&T, but, but something government run? But like so much of our lives are online now, both personal and professional, at, you know, at the government level and so on. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that your major infrastructure concerns for malfeasance were, were basically like power grids, right? I mean, you recall like 10, 15 years ago when all of New York went dark for a period of time and there was just kind of vast chaos uh, about that or like the rolling blackouts in California mm -hmm. at the beginning of the 2000s. And that was like the, the center of the concern. But now with everything being interconnected, there is a lot of opportunity for people out there who don't have our best interests at heart. I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's pretty important that we focus on these kind of things from a federal gov government standpoint, because you know there are, are terrorism and, and actors like Hamas and Hezbollah, Iran, and others around the world who would love the opportunity to do something to our infrastructure that would cause mass chaos in the United States. Well, And, and there's mm -hmm. rumors now of, of the Russians trying to put Nukes in space, yeah. You know, weapons in space basically to target our satellites. And so, if, yeah, you took out a satellite, you know, you could take down a lot of our tech infrastructure in the United States. Yeah, whether it's whether it's a problem with the tech or it's a problem with nukes in space, I just like to know that Joe Biden's hand is on the wheel, <laughs> that he is the person charged with keeping us safe. Because I'm confident that nothing bad will happen between now think, and next yeah. January. I mean, he How did cure cancer. That? Remember that? <laughs> right. How do you think? How do you think he remembers his iPhone password? Uh, do you think he has one? <laughs> uh, he can't. It's got to no be just the facial way. recognition. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Somebody opens it for him in the morning, and then he just says facial recognition. <laughs> By the way, did you hear about the dog? The White House dog oh, commander. Yeah. yeah. Is oh the worst my god. Dog in the world. 
the worst dog ever. So these people are totally heartless in the Biden administration. And the, the Joe and Jill Biden, frankly, we knew that Commander, their big, beautiful German Shepherd, was very, very mean. Um, <laughs> and but and it, it, it made news to the point where they had to actually move the dog out of the White House to an undisclosed assignment, which like. Is that the farm? Was that like when my fa- my parents told me Bozo went to the farm? <laughs> Dog ran away. Because <laughs> he also bit some people. Next thing I knew, I never saw him again. Anyway, um, so Commander finally got moved after all this public pressure. But it turns out, thanks to um, an, a FOIA request, that I, it was CNN, actually, I think, that that was requested it. Somebody requested the documents and CNN reported on the results. Yeah, it was from the U.S. Yeah. Secret Service. So what we found out was it was much worse than we even knew. Commander had joined as a puppy. He was, quote, removed from the White House last call to an undisclosed location. That's even worse. Undisclosed location. It's like, oh, no. it, it, it's like they renditioned him to a black site. <laughs> Don't think one time, oh, Michael. <laughs> okay, so he's been removed the reason he was removed is because he bit just U.S. Service Secret Service personnel. This only covered them. The FOIA request went to Secret Service only, so this doesn't oh. include the chefs in the White House or the you know maids. At least twenty-four different incidents, <laughs> two dozen bites, um, an unnamed assistant special agent in charge of the Presidential Protection Division wrote to the team in a June twenty twenty-three email warned the agents they must, quote, must be creative to ensure our personal safety. This is, this was being allowed, that the age Secret oh, Service I, had to be creative to, to stay safe. And it's, it's no joke. Creative. Listen to this. Dr. Jill, doctor, just to those of you not yeah. paying attention, um, this Earned incident it. would have been actually very helpful for her to actually be a doctor. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> here's what you happened. A yeah, a a unnamed, <laughs> a, a, no, no, I mean, a medical doctor could have saved this poor agent, but her PhD in education can't do that. An unnamed special agent was providing security coverage in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. As the agent walked to a backyard security, po- security post, did not realize commander was loose and off leash. Can you imagine the terror? These are like straight trained killers, these agents, but they know they're not allowed to shoot commander. So they just have to sit back and take it. In the background, special agent somebody heard the voice, this is all redacted, which is why I'm not reading it, heard the voice of what believes uh, to be FLOTUS, Dr. Jill Biden, yelling blank. Commander ran toward the direction of something and bit the special agent in the left <laughs> forearm, causing a severe, deep, open wound. As a result of the attack, a special agent started to lose a significant amount of blood no. from their arm. I'll give you another one. Notable incident involving the president. October 2, 2022, an agent, different agent, I think, was bitten on the forearm, definitely a different incident, while holding the door open in the area between the West Wing and the residence. Commander and POTUS were entering the palm room through the West Colonnade. Commander came in, first circled back. He's like stalking, grabbed <laughs> my left arm. He then stood up and then back down. He is literally my height standing, writes the agent. Oh my, God. <laughs> my God. The agent uh, <laughs> said in a description of the event that they were in shock that this incident took place. Uh, the it's Bidens have apologized to those who were bitten and sent flowers to some of oh, them. That's, that's what you to want. some of them. Just a nice bouquet. That'll take care of the arm. <laughs> yeah, you got to feel for you these got another one? Me. These guys are supposed to be looking out for threats, you know, like assassins and things like <laughs> the threat that. threat is from within. <laughs> their, their, head, their heads are constantly on a swivel. Little do they know the real threat is at their feet. <laughs> I just keep Terrifying. thinking, you know, you always after a president leaves, you hear all kinds of stories from White House staff that have seen many presidents. They all have favorites and there's like little quirks about it. I guarantee you that this is the most mistreated staff in the, in the face of history. Yeah. When it comes to the White House. Imagine just putting wrapping your mind around you're going to live in a house where people work mm-hmm. around you mm-hmm. all the time. And you're like, I, you know what? 
what we're going to do is buy a Timberwolf. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going to train him at all. Exactly. And, then, and then we're going to set him loose. Exactly. And what how happens do you get to 24? How, how do you get to 24? But like, I, I can understand, you know, like four. I could <laughs> potentially understand like 10. I don't know. It's the White House. He's, 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 I'm sure the dog is there to be protective. So like, Cause. it's not going to be a little clearly. sweet. You know, I don't know. Saw. He saw everything Golden that Hunter was getting away with, and he's like, <laughs> you know, is he, I'm, you know, I'm going to find by his example uh, my own way to act out. You think the dog's on cocaine? It's possible. <laughs> cocaine dog. Yeah. Cocaine. cocaine commander. Yeah. Anyway, in related news, uh, Commander is now part of the Burisma board. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the sound of undisclosed location. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Further Commander. updates to follow on the next FOIA request. Uh, but yeah, that's the latest out of the White House. However, there is real news out of the White House today, not involving the dog. And that is President Biden is apparently scared shitless of the numbers on immigration and how people think he's doing handling the job and has now realized he actually can do something about it, notwithstanding all those claims we heard him make when the deal with the Republicans fell through. And he was like, I need this bill. I need Congress to act or I can't do anything. Remember? In fact, if you don't, here he was back a couple of months ago. Well, not even just in January in SOT 1. Absolutely not all I can do. Just give me the power. I've asked for the very day I got it off. Give me the border control. Give me the people, give me the people, the judges. Give me the people who can stop this. If that bill were the law today, I'd shut down the border right now and fix it quickly. That's what he oh, said. And God. then also went on to say, I need that bill to do anything. And now per the New York Times, President Biden mulling plan that could restrict asylum claims at the border. He's considering doing it by executive action without Congress implementing many of the same things that President Trump implemented back in 2018 when he tried to block certain migration, including by enacting the so-called Muslim ban, which Biden and the left criticized to no end and actually challenged him in court all the way up to the Supreme Court over and said it was immoral. And now he's considering implementing that same measure beyond Muslims, uh, but to use that same provision. And um, some of the other provisions that failed in that border bill that fell apart, like um, it would have a similar trigger for blocking asylum claims to new entrants. It would allow him to shut down the border to new entrants if more than an average of 5,000 migrants per day tried to cross unlawfully in the course of a week, or more than 8,500 tried to cross on any given day, all of which he said he could not do. And you tell me, um, this is obviously just, uh, he's terrified. He's actually paying attention yeah. to the polls now. Yeah, well, you. I heard Biden say that if he had these authorities, he would have acted on his first day as president <laughs> of the United States. Let me read to you what he did on his literal first day as president of the United States. Proclamation on the termination of emergency with respect to the southern border of the United States and redirection of funds diverted to border wall construction. That oh, is January 20th, 2021, hours after he was sworn in. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it is the single most disingenuous thing in a White House that is absolutely full of disingenuous political claims. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care a lick about what's happening on the southern border. In fact, it's by design. That mm -hmm. is what he said he would do, and that is what he has done. He removed all of the progress that President Trump had made, got rid of uh, the Remain in Mexico policy and the Title 42 and all of the rest of that, and then proceeded to embark on seeing that we inevitably get to this catastrophic point. Now he's got a political problem. He doesn't care a lick about the actual problem. What he cares a lot about is his 33% approval rating and the fact that this issue, maybe more than anything else, is preventing a second term for Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. what this is about. And, and in terms of I mean, what you read is incredible. Mm -hmm. How you could stand there and say to the American people, if I had uh, all of these things on day one, I would have done, I would have secured the border, when in fact, he did the exact opposite of mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. not just on that, but then the remain in Mexico and everything else. I mean, it's just, it blows your mind. And yeah, kudos to you, late, Ashbrook, and actually doing the homework to pull it up, you know, right, right? To actually show us what he, what he did. 
Megan, it's way too little too late. And it, since he issued that proclamation, eight and a half million people have entered this country illegally. Do you know how many m million people eight and a half million is? That's the same population of all five boroughs of New York City in this country illegally while Joe Biden was president, thanks to the proclamation that he issued to open the border the day he was sworn in. It's, it's more than the population I read online of 36 states combined. Like, mm. yeah, you it's get, a lot you of get, people. Yeah, maybe not combined, maybe just 36 states. Um, but it's, it's a lot of, like another Megan, country that's coming into our country. Yes. It is, and it, it's a lot. It's not everybody looking to, to make a better life for themselves and have a job in America. There are people shipping in from China and from Yemen, walking through the Darien Gap, and are coming into this country specifically to do us harm. That's mm -hmm. a terrifying thought. Well, it's too late. It doesn't matter. I don't care whether he puts all these measures in place. He could do all the same stuff Trump did when Trump was president. And it's too late. The people know. They, they know at this point it would just be a pander. His heart isn't in it. And as soon as they reelect this guy, he's going to undo them all. Because when he did the thing on day one, he said he wanted people to believe the United States was, quote, more humane. That's yeah. where his heart lies, not in protecting our borders. Yeah, and on a serious note, all of the day late and a dollar short political pandering at this point is not going to bring back the, the people who lost children to fentanyl who mm -hmm. crossed over our yeah. southern border. They're not mm -hmm. going to bring back the lives of victims of sex trafficking that is rampant on the southern border. These are real experiences that people across this country have had. And almost every community, you will meet someone who has experienced this tragedy, and he's directly responsible for it. Did you guys see over the weekend that the um, former CEO of YouTube, Susan Wojcicki, um, her son died, one pill. He was at no, Berkeley. Terrible, heartbreaking. He was at Berkeley, he took a pill. I can't remember what he thought it was, but it was you know something that the kids today would take, not thinking it was gonna do anything more than you know affect him temporarily. And it hasn't been confirmed, at least I haven't checked in a couple of days, that it was fentanyl, but you know it's probably fentanyl. You know, I mean, that's what happened. That's, that's how those one pills do kill. They get laced with fentanyl. The Chinese are pushing it in. The Mexican drug cartels are making the pills. They're farming them out. They push them on social media. We saw mm -hmm. that at the testimonials that, that all these parents were giving when the, the um, CEOs showed up on Capitol Hill of Facebook and, you know, all those. They order it on Snapchat. They order it on Meta, whatever. And they take the one pill thinking it's an Ambien or it's um, oh. an Adderall and mm -hmm. or like a Valium, whatever, it's laced with fentanyl and they die. I mean, it can happen to anybody, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. And so you're right, this is directly linked. It's not entirely caused by our open border, but for sure, this is a massive problem uh, connected to it. And there's absolutely no willingness to do anything unless it's gonna help Joe Biden. He's care yeah. He cares about him, about his hide, but not so yeah. much about your children's. That's, that's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. And it's it's so sad to think about. And college kids, I mean, look, people are uniquely susceptible to this kind of thing. We all went to college. I'm sure this doesn't apply to Megan, who was uh, captain of the math team, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, during her <laughs> experience. But, you I know, was I was mean, rather buttoned up, though, though not that, not that buttoned up. <laughs> No but, you know, for the rest of us, look, I mean, most people in a college experience, there's there are recreational drug use uh, that happens. And to think now you're at a, a, a day and age where one pill that you think was an ambient mm -hmm. kills mm -hmm. kids. I mean, that is that's a truly genuinely scary crisis. I do not know and I cannot figure out for the life of me why this hasn't become the national emergency yeah, that it, it very well deserves to be. Yes. It shouldn't. Be. If you listen to the experts on it, there's a group called Fentanyl Fathers. It's led by this guy whose whose son died of a fentanyl overdose, and he's going into schools all over the country and is basically making the case that you should have Narcan in every home and every place, just like you would have a fire extinguisher. Everybody has a fire God. extinguisher because they know when a fire starts, they put it out. Narcan can yeah. act the same, and so I, I, it seems pretty important that uh, people start just, adopting that. Right. I mean, honestly, yeah. all all. I mean, our condolences go to Susan and her entire family. They're, that It's just too awful to even think about. All you can do is keep saying to your kids over and over and over, one pill can kill. Don't do drugs. Please don't do drugs. Please, please, please. I mean, I say yeah. too to, you know, my kids are too young to be even thinking about any of this. But like, the other thing is like, hold your own beer. Like, don't have somebody pour you a yeah. drink in a fraternity. You have to be so careful, especially as a young woman. There's just so much, there's so many risks out there and we can't protect them against all of it. But- this one, this one, we actually can do something to, yeah. to try, right? We can, 
we can actually do something about shutting down the border, trying to limit the flow of illegal drugs like fentanyl, stopping even the Americans who come across the southern border with fentanyl, trying to make money off of our young people. But we're not. Uh, we're not doing enough. That's obvious. Okay. Um, on the subject of politics, we mentioned before that, you know, the number twos in this election could be unusually important given Joe Biden's age and Donald Trump's age and just, you know, erratic <laughs> nature, let's say his erratic nature. Um, who that's going to be, we still don't know. But Ron DeSantis back in the news today as having come out to say, um, to quote Charlie Bucket after um, four tickets had gone and there was just one mm -hmm. left. Just in case you're wondering whether it will be me, it won't be. It won't be. It's <laughs> <laughs> a great pull. <laughs> he <laughs> said he's not, he meant what he said during the campaign. He's not into being the number two. And he is not going to be Trump's VP, even though Trump had mentioned him as a possibility. And the reason I think this is interesting, guys, you tell me, is because apparently he said this on a phone call with backers of his presidential bid, you know, the unsuccessful one, the one that has been suspended. And um, one of the guys on the call, or maybe gals, it's just described as one Republican on the call, uh, this is from NBC, said, I'm wondering whether after that call, he's keeping his options open for 2024. Quote, the timing of this ostensible thank you call to influential state level Republicans, the DeSantis campaign recruited to be delegates to the 2024 convention is odd. A month ago, sure, but now it really seems like the governor is trying to keep the door open in the event something happens between now and Milwaukee, meaning the August convention. So what do you guys think? Yeah, well, look, it's not the weirdest thing in the entire world. I mean, we talked about, a little bit about this uh, this week as it pertains to Nikki Haley. And obviously she's going into her home state of South Carolina and has said that she's going beyond a Super Tuesday. And the question is like, well, why? I mean, you're down... 25, 30 points. I don't think the outcome of any of these particular elections is in doubt by any stretch of the imagination. Why would she stay in? Well, I think it's the same reason why this person's speculating about Ron DeSantis this year is because we live in the most dynamic political atmosphere that this country has ever seen. Every day is a brand new day and anything can happen. And you've got- Ask Fanny. Two, two, uh, yeah, ask <laughs> Fanny about that. Uh, <laughs> but we got two octogenarians who are going to be on the ticket here and yeah you know if you if you were able to get a couple of delegates as nikki haley appears to be trying to do if something weird happens god forbid uh they got to go through you to find a nominee right mm -hmm. because you actually have some delegates so it's not the dumbest strategy in the world to keep options open i think it probably they're all realistic about that not happening but it's it I, i'm not as surprised i think as a lot of people are I don't know what makes what I don't think Nikki Haley would be the number two. I think if Trump bell, bowed out or got thrown in jail or something, she wouldn't be second, you know, lady in waiting. It'd probably be DeSantis, don't you think? Like the no, fact that he it, got it out be. a state or two before she did doesn't make her next in line. It just means she failed to accept reality at a later date. Yeah, and I wasn't even thinking about this as it pertains to VP. I mean, I was thinking about top of the ticket, right? No, but I mean, that's what I'm talking about too. I'm saying if if Trump bails for whatever reason, she's not she's not next in line just because she decided to quit later than the others. No, but my point is is that if she had a couple of delegates, right? I mean, it's not it's not an unforeseen possibility in some of these states that don't have winner take all that she could pick up a handful of delegates. And if you go to a process at an RNC convention where delegates delegates are awarded, unless you release them are pertinent to the conversation, right? And so at that point, you'd have to figure out if there's one candidate is still in the race that has delegates awarded to them, they're gonna be a part of that conversation. And that was yeah. kind of the only thing I was making. Mm. I agree, part of, but I just think, I, I don't think Trump's going anywhere, but you just never know, as you point no, out. I so, agree with that. <laughs> so I agree with that. Yeah, so I, I I don't disagree that Ron DeSantis probably does want to keep his options open, just you know, just in case. I will say this, Trump advisor Chris Lasavita responded on X to the story with the following. Chicken fingers and pudding cups is what you will be remembered for, you sad little man. <laughs> so. Las Vida never minces words. No, he's no. pretty straight shooter. Right, <laughs> right, straight right shooter. to the point. Yeah, <laughs> they know how to craft a, an image, don't they? So speaking of Nikki Haley, um, her husband, who is an active duty military, and I think in Djibouti, right? He's been in Djibouti for the past couple of years or a year. Um, 
She started talking about him on Tuesday in South Carolina. And now he was kind of brought up recently because Trump was like, where's the husband? Where is he? Why, is, why isn't he around? And then the media, you know, yeah, because they care so deeply about Nikki Haley and about our military, decided mm -hmm. to pretend to be offended. Like he knows very well where the husband is. He's deployed. How dare he? I mean, it wasn't a nice comment by Trump, but it's like, it's fun to watch the media try to, you know, pick its things that it gets outraged over. Like, please. Um, and then Nikki Haley saw an opportunity because, right, it kind of made her look like the dutiful wife and my husband's deployed and now I'm under attack. And so she's been bringing him up a little bit more. And she had the following moment, which Sonny Hostin, I'm going to give you the, a preview into the second clip, did not buy for one minute. So this is your chance to say whether for once you agree with Sonny Hostin or not. Was this moment disingenuous? Watch Nikki Haley, Saad 8. As I prepare for what lies ahead, Michael is at the forefront of my mind. I wish Michael was here today. And I wish our children and I could see him tonight, but we can't. Mm. Okay. Here is the reaction over on The View. I didn't feel that it was authentic so, and I didn't trust it. Well, I thought it was a real moment because mm. I think what you think that, that she misses her husband. Yeah. I but, guess I have a dark heart. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but her um, uh, approval ratings went up when her husband was attacked and she stood up for him. And so I read into that moment, mm -hmm. if I now throw in a little tear, my approval ratings will go mm -hmm. up again. Uh, it's just gentlemen her rating her approval ratings went up with she's watching snap polls she's tracking the <laughs> noted, tracking nikki's favorables That's, noted political look, operatives who are you kidding? kidding it's happened before do you remember exactly. hillary clinton in new hampshire oh, i just yeah, yeah, really yeah. think i just really think yeah. remember she actually managed to produce not an actual tear let's be honest it's hillary clinton but like close I'm, I'm, Right. <laughs> Megan, I'm just saying, if we're talking about being disingenuous, the idea that Sonny Hostin's getting overnights in her polling from some, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's preposterous, okay? It's absolutely preposterous. And I, I will say Fair this, point. to just try to contextualize a little bit about that Nikki Haley, and I, I didn't talk to anyone in this campaign about it, but I've been a part of a lot of campaigns, and you get to a point where you've run ragged, and mm. you've gone months on months on the road, you are spending all of your time either on the phone or in front of people. And there are moments where you become more emotional. When you think about family and things like that, it's just a part of the process. There's not a single candidate, and I mean that sincerely. There's not a single candidate who has ever run for president or like Senate that doesn't have that moment at some point. Now, you don't always want to have that on camera, but I think that could be what you're looking at. There. Well, because, because every single day you wake up and you say to yourself, like, is this worth it? Yeah. You know, and the answer has to be yes every single day. And when you're running for president, that is a grueling, grueling, grueling um, thing to do. So, I, I mean, I think it's inevitable, you know, being in this race as long as she has, facing the long odds, odds that she is, uh, that we'd probably see something like this. But, like, I mean, who's, who is Sonny Hostins to, to, to be commenting on this? I mean, what an <laughs> ugly, ugly thing to say. You know, I just I like find that she owns her dark heart. So yeah, well, no, I, I appreciate that. She knows herself pretty well because it's clearly true. Yeah. I think they're, uh, they, that's a co that collection that they've got on that show, and you would know more than I do about it. They seem like the worst people in the world. They're just so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't they? so interesting. You should use that phrase because I have someone else for you to consider. I, okay, I have okay. somebody else in the running. Okay. Um, Katie Turr was over on MSNBC commenting on the Trump massive judgment from Judge Engron. It's going to wind up being $450 million that he owes if you add the interest in in this New York civil fraud, fraud case against his, the Trump organization. And when the news broke, she was raising some questions about whether this number is fair, whether the verdict is fair, you know, like you might do if you were like a reporter just covering a story. Well, she used to date a testament to her terrible judgment, at least at <laughs> one point in her life, Keith Olbermann. Oh and my like God. the complete prick that he is and has always been, he decided to go on his little podcast and react as follows. 
Her. I got a text from her at 9.14 p.m. on December 11, uh, 2016. This is called having the receipts. Trump had won. Our nightmare had begun. And Katie had gotten a book deal about her experience. Then she switched topics. Quote, want to write this book? I wrote back at 5.32, what? You're not serious. How would that work? That's when she phoned. She was about to give the advance money back to the publisher. I can't write a book. I'm like 50,000 words short, and it's terrible. I'll give you half the money. I'll give you more than half the money. I pointed out to her that I had written or rewritten dozens of her stories for NBC News and MSNBC, and it was not the question of the money. It was a question of what we could get away with. Each time I wrote or rewrote in her name for NBC, it was a fireable offense for her, but one that nobody would ever think to look for, even though there is necessarily an email trail 10 miles long. But a book, a book about Trump in my writing style, not hers in print. I have a fairly distinct writing style and I'm not good at hiding it. Somebody would notice Wow. Such a Fuck bastard. You. Such a bastard. He this isn't the first time he's done this to her. He continues <laughs> to raise this story and other stories that he thinks will reflect badly on Katie Turr, who broke his heart or something, because he is a bitter, bitter man who oh continues God. to do this to his ex, who was his live-in love for I think a period of years. He's a sick person. <laughs> I mean, he talks about his distinctive writing style. Yeah, it's a, it's a special uh, italicies called asshole. Yeah. That's what that's what it is. It's it's very distinctive, I just, Un- unmistakable. I just feel bad for Keith that you know he's really scraping the bottom of the barrel for content for his show. That he's digging up text messages oh, from girlfriends. Yeah, <laughs> from eight years ago. Jeez, what a sad little life. Oh, and by the way, what did she say that was so awful? Like, let's find out what set him off that he needed to go off on her like let's listen to it we actually have it cut watch in the past it has only been used to ban someone doing business when it's been shown that somebody was hurt is this fair to go after donald trump like this in this environment (laughs) get get out of here that's what set him off (laughs) just a normal question are you you kidding me that's the thing that set him off no this is the disease I was waiting yes, for right? the, I was waiting for the two scholars she was asking the question for. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm sure they were going to exonerate Trump in the next sentence. Let's take another yeah. look. Yes, you raise a good point. They jumped out at me too. Can we take another look at that control room? Could we please just take one more look at that clip? That clip. Yeah. Let's see the panel. In the past, it has only been used to ban someone doing business when it's been shown that somebody was hurt. Is this fair to oh, go after Donald Trump like this in this Oh, there they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Google, Google Gemini. Google Gemini. Show me Don King. <laughs> 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 uh, you're wow. so right. Gee, I wonder what the panelists are going to say. Hmm. Who's be on? <laughs> also, can you, you he got believe? fired from MSNBC, right? Like, what a self, everywhere self yeah. own I that mean, he's like. Oh, I'm just sitting around daytime watching the <laughs> programs I got fired from. <laughs> and, uh, I couldn't help but notice there was a question that was asked from panelists that I disagree with. What a meanwhile. Jerk. She went on, she married somebody else. He's also in news. I think she's having a lovely life. He's this unmarried, no children, no friends, bitter, bitter man who just sits there and waits for the mildest of fair coverage to cast his meanest barbs at this former person with whom he lived for, count them, three years, fellas, three years. The moral of this story is do not date Keith Olbermann, for the love of God. <laughs> Whatever you're going through, stop it. Whatever you're going through. It's not worth it. Being alone <laughs> is not that bad. It's not no. that bad. You, you can it's have not. plenty of fun. Yeah. We you did can, a story you- yesterday. There's some group, now they're being federally prosecuted, so it didn't wind up good. But um, they had a company called Orgasm Inc. And for $36,000 a year, they could show you how to have an orgasm. So like, I'm saying I would rather pay that than date him. What? Name your price. 
<laughs> self owning again. It's like I know nobody's ever had one of these, so I've, I've generated some kind of tip guy. And we're going to be, they're going to be selling for a low, low price of nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> oh my god, we're definitely doing an in depth story on this whole thing. Like I'm absolutely loving the, the, that entire story. Okay, Debbie Murphy, Canadian Debbie, tells me these women did not directly answer the question. Uh, one was, let's see, uh, former New York assistant, what, assistant AG? Yeah, Tristan Snell answered and said, the legal standard is whether there was a tendency to deceive. That's what it is. And the legislature in New York made a public policy choice to say that that was an important weapon for the AG's office to have to vindicate mm -hmm. the public good in this situation. You nailed it. She's against yeah. Trump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Shocker. A lot of vindication yeah. going on. By That's the way, on that thing, did you see Tish James out there saying if necessary, she's going to seize Trump's assets in New York to pay this judgment. Yeah, He's got, I think, just like a couple more days to either put up the money. Uh, he's asked for a longer time to like file an appeal or figure out what they're going to do. I don't know that he's going to get it, but he's going to have to put up hundreds of millions of dollars within the next couple of days. And she says, if he doesn't, she's going to start seizing assets, potentially an asset he has downtown, maybe around the Wall Street uh, area, I, maybe Trump Tower. I mean, if that shit starts happening, you guys, I, yeah. I know people are kind of like, over the Trump drama. It's all been factored into the vote counts and the polls. But I like, I just feel like even the average person could see how ridiculous that is. But I don't, maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I think they do. And so much so that I read reports this week that other New York officials were running around trying to reassure other investors in New York properties and things like that, that this was not going to happen to them, right? It, it, it's it's a, it, an admission it, it, by fact that this is an extrajudicial proceeding, mm -hmm. that this is a political targeting, which yeah. is clear. Look, like, I didn't sit through the entire hearing. I don't know what the facts are, I, but I do know this. It's happened too many times mm -hmm. in New York. It's happening in Georgia. I mean, to say what you will of the federal cases, let's just set those aside for a second. What's happening in state courts around this country is a genuine problem that was funded by George Soros over a, a series of years with prosecutors that ultimately end up being judges. There is a crisis happening in every one of these metropolitan areas where you've got people that are, are taking out political vendettas under the guise of lawmaking. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, that's I, ridiculous. And I love the idea that, you know, the, the state legislature made a policy preference oh, you know, yes, to yes. protect the people of the state ensure their confidence in the legal system. It's like, you, you talk to your average New Yorker, do you think they care more about, you know, the crime that they're seeing in their street? Or like whether a bank was, uh, you know, gave too good of loan terms to Donald Trump, a loan in which he repaid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's 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 insane. Totally nuts. Yeah. yeah. Here she is, she, by the way. Here's Tiff, J Tish James saying it was to uh, ABC. Watch. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek... Uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court. And we will ask the judge to seize his assets. So financial frauds are not victimless crimes. He engaged in this massive amount of fraud. And it wasn't just a simple mistake, a slight oversight. The variations were wildly exaggerated. And the extent of the fraud was staggering. Trump said the penalty against him would drive other businesses out of New York. And last I checked, tourism is up. And Wall Street is doing just fine. Mm. Does she, she always talks. talk like she's on NPR? <laughs> <Or what? laughs> that seems like a new. I thought I thought I was listening to All Things Considered. <laughs> <laughs> it is so true. I can't I mean, stand that sound on NPR. I really I like. I'm trying to get my morning news. I go to the left. I go to the right. I listen to NPR. I feel like they're coming on to me every morning. Like just stop it. <laughs> they, they, they can get jobs at Orgasm Inc. <laughs> <laughs> That's because part of the the twelve step program that they lay out. It's yeah. heavy, heavy NPR. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, she also said, "We're prepared to make sure that the judgment is paid to New Yorkers." And yes, I look at Forty Wall Street each and every day. By the way, Ugh. to your point, there's been they they went after his company criminally in this like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Then they came um, after them civilly in this case with this you know, nearly half a billion dollar judgment. They changed the law in New York state so that E. Jean Carroll could bring this lawsuit accusing him of sexual assault and then ultimately defamation. She brought that case. Then she brought another case resulting in an $83 million judgment. 
that's all before we get to the criminal case that's going to start March against yeah. him with, you know, on, on this Stormy Daniels hush money. I mean, it's that's five just in the past few years against Trump and his organization in New York State alone, alone. Yeah. And that's why, like, that's why I have zero empathy for Fannie Willis. I hope somebody's looking into Alvin Bragg, too. I really do. I hope they're looking into Judge Engeron. You guys want to play what, by, the, by these rules? Let's play. Let's do it. How does it work out for everybody? Yeah, I, I think that's well said. It's also important to know that this is not unique to Donald Trump. It is in this current era because he is target A1A. And all of the liberal left wants to get him no matter what. But this is something that has been happening over a period of time in the United States where we've had completely Democrat progressive run judicial systems and local governments where the choice you have as a business owner or somebody who just resides is you either shut up and play along or we come after you in some way, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you remember the the conservative donors that were targeted by the IRS, mm -hmm. right? The releases of tax uh, forms. There's a mayor in, in uh, Illinois, I read this week, who was shaking down people for contributions and then she would uh, cancel their business license if they didn't pony up. Yeah. I mean, this has been a tool of the left that has been amongst the most disgusting things, but it's, 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 it's been happening. Mm -hmm. It's just now that everybody's getting up to speed. Mm -hmm. and, and where has it left them? After everything that they're doing up to this point, Trump has leads in multiple swing yeah. states. It's because regular Americans know when people are trying to manipulate them and they don't like it. And maybe things change. Maybe maybe the federal trial changes people's opinions. But right now, she looks an awful lot like Trump's number one surrogate, not like the person who's trying to bring him down. Yeah. Mm. All right, now stand by. Um, we're gonna take a quick break, but as we go to break, I'll give you this from Charles C.W. Cook of National Review. In Google Gemini's defense, I just asked it to show me a photo of the best Supreme Court justice, and it generated a picture of a black guy. <laughs> well done. All right, the fellas from Ruthless, stay with us. One more block together. Don't go away. With cyber attacks on the rise, protecting your data security is more important than ever. So why is Congress considering a bill that could put your credit card data at greater risk of being hacked and exposed to foreign networks? Our advertiser, the Electronic Payments Coalition, says the Durbin Marshall credit card bill shifts billions in consumer spending to less secure payment networks, all so that corporate megastores can make bigger profits. Find out more about the issue at electronicpaymentscoalition.org and decide for yourself if you would like to tell your senators to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. All right, guys, so... The New York City dance team, NYPD ladies, have decided to burn off some of the stress from the job by dancing together. And it's there's so many angles to this story, I don't even know where to begin, but I'll just give you a flavor for how it looks. And then we can talk about the controversy that ensued. Watch. Okay, you get the you get the gist of it. Make it stop. <laughs> Holmes' his face. It looks genuinely concerned. <laughs> Who's that? So, yeah. So there are there's a lot of thoughts about this, and they started taking a lot of hits for this. Some people thought they should be out policing. Some people thought um, that Wild we're position. spending too much on cops. Um, basically, the NYPD responded by saying that they do this on their own time. It's their form of stress release, uh, you know, r relief. Nothing, no, no program was cut to fund this. It's their own private project. I will tell you this. <laughs> My problem with it is false. I'm, and I'm all for like, you know, exercise and burning off stress. But some of these women look very out of shape. And I'm you, just saying, you it plays say right into- yeah, I, I'm saying it. There, it plays right into a pre-existing problem with the police force, not just in the in New York City, but in many cities across America post George Floyd. We cannot get basically fit. 
people to want to join policing. And I will tell you, it just so happens I just had, I'm not going to say it was, but it was an NYPD officer pull me aside before this video to say that this is a massive problem they're experiencing with overweight and in some cases obese cops, in particular women, but it can be, go both ways, who can't even chase after the criminals they're trying to arrest. We have lowered the standards so much that we're actually missing arrests and bad guys. And I actually looked into it and sure enough, it's true. First of all, in 2022, amid, amid a wave of retirements, that's the left's fault. They, in NYPD, they replaced a faux six foot wall inside the police academy gym with a chain link fence. Hell, even I could climb that. I'll let you <laughs> stick your foot in the thing. We all get it. Here it is. Look, look, look. This is oh, chain link. <laughs> no, 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 no. Come on. That's no, not wait, the didn't... same. This is ridiculous. Why did, it take, why did it take two tries to get over that? Yeah. <laughs> this is the problem. And secondly, then yeah, they scrapped the timed 1.5 mile run for oh, new no. recruits that you used to have to do, saying they hoped more women would make the cut. And sure enough, did they did. And their explanation was no cop on patrol ever has to run a mile and a half. No one's chasing anyone a mile and a half. So my problem is, is like, all right, dance all you want, but just like get in shape, would you? And like, you shouldn't have been admitted to the police department if you can't fit into like the standard uniform and perform basic fitness tests, male or female. This is a problem and it's not politically incorrect to, to talk about it. So there. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that you uh, started with your observations and not ours. <laughs> uh, on, a, on the policing front, I think it's I think it's two things. Obviously, there's a diversity requirement with some of these forces where it makes no sense. I mean, you want cops and firefighters, first responders, everybody to be able to do the job to the best of their ability or they shouldn't be there in the first place. But the other side of this coin is what the left has done by making policing impossible is take an awful lot of people who are very interested in becoming part of our law enforcement community and saying, no, thanks. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll go back to the military. I'll go uh, in private security. I'll go do a bunch of different things because if I so much as arrest somebody and look at them weird, I'm going to be brought up on trial, mm -hmm. right? And this is part of the downstream effect that we've had since the George Floyd incident in 2020 where policing itself is very difficult to find people that to recruit that are qualified to do the job. Now, the ones that are there, by and large, are terrific. But again, you look at something like that, and it seems like, well, uh, standards maybe have slipped a bit. Yeah, we, we found video. Look at this video out of Chicago where there were four female cops trying to arrest one guy, even though they outnumbered him. Look at this. He got away. Look, there's four female cops, one guy. He flicks him off with very little trouble. He ran, he got away from him. Like, I'm sorry, I'm all for, you know, if you're fit, there are some women who are just crushers and they're strong and they're tough. I'm sure they could do the job better than some out of shape men, but it seems to be going the other way in too many instances. And I say this humbly, my fellow women, I went, I, I'm secretly a Marine. You may not know this about me, but I, I, I did Marine camp training for one weekend at Camp Lejeune for a story. And look at me <laughs> trying to get over the wall. Look at this. Uh oh. Yeah, no. It was uh -oh. a no. It was impossible. <laughs> it was so hard. Look, did the, down. Did the, guy, the guy have to I try never. to like, go up right next to you to try to show you up? <laughs> he, did, yeah. he was trying, like, he was trying to encourage me. You, there he you is. Do it. Oh, I, yeah. I couldn't do it. But I am a podcaster, a journalist, and somebody who sits around all day. I don't, I'm not trying to arrest people. I'm, I, saying, I'm pretty oh, sure you could take smug down. I know, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Well, I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that was cool, second but, that. Yeah. The best is AOC. She's outraged over this. Meanwhile, she is responsible for defunding the police in the first place. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror if you want to know the source of this problem. Ladies, in summary, continue getting in shape. Um, I think we should bring back the wall. I think we should bring back the run. And I actually think we should be adding a few more requirements, paying our cops better, giving them better mm -hmm. benefits, lifting them up rhetorically and in the spirit so that they can go out there and do the job that they, we need them to do instead of people yeah. like AOC ripping them at every turn and calling them racist when they're not. Okay. Yeah. Great to have you guys. It's always, uh, it's always so a fun. pleasure. Love it. To Thanks be for continued. having us.
I love to smug. All right, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I wanna to tell you that there's no show tomorrow because I'm actually gonna be at CPAC and um, we're gonna bring you those remarks on Saturday morning. So just wait until Saturday and we'll have a release for you. Hopefully you'll find it interesting and we will see you again on Monday. <laughs>